This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of violence or drugs or criminal activity in any way. So how does a guy who has never been to South America before and who had no formal pilot training whatsoever convince Pablo Escobar and the Medellin drug cartel to let him be the smuggler that they should trust to fly billions of dollars of cocaine into the United States? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we are going to look at the life and times of George Jung, nicknamed Boston George and El Americano by the Colombians. He was an American drug trafficker and smuggler and a major figure in the cocaine trade in the United States in the 1970s and the early 80s. We will look at how he got involved in smuggling in the first place and then how an unbelievably fortuitous circumstance left him sharing a prison cell with none other than Carlos Letter, who would be one of the founders of the Medellin drug cartel, which, under the direction of one Pablo Escobar, would become one of the most powerful drug trafficking organizations to ever exist. We will examine how they smuggled the cocaine into the United States, how George Jung amassed a fortune of over $100 million, and then how the entire operation came crashing down. All in today's episode. If you enjoy the video today, do me a favor, hit that like button for me. If you got a question, you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button for me. And you guys know it, I love it when you share my videos on social media. Most of what we know about George Jung's life was obtained through his own memoirs that he wrote while sitting in a prison cell. His version was called Grazing in the Grass Until the Snow Came, which was rewritten and published by Bruce Porter as a book entitled Blow. That work became the basis of the biopic that most of us are familiar with, wherein Jung was portrayed by Johnny Depp in the movie Blow, released in 2001. And the story starts when George Jacob Jung was born to Frederick and Erman Jung on August 6, 1942 in Weymouth, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. George grew up poor, but by high school was a star football player very charismatic and was described by his classmates as a natural leader. It was also during high school when he would have his first brush with the law after soliciting sex from an undercover police officer posing as a prostitute. After graduating high school in 1961, Jung briefly attended the University of Southern Mississippi and the University of Tennessee, where he studied marketing before dropping out. It was during college that Jung began partying, recreationally using marijuana, and where he witnessed firsthand the tremendous demand for pot. As he quickly discovered, he could buy in a little bit of bulk and sell a portion of his stash to pay for the whole lot, basically developing a system to get himself free weed. And this got the wheels in his head a spinning. So it's 1967, and after returning home for a spell, George and a childhood buddy he called Tuna took off for Long Beach, California. It was there that they saw the hippie movement in full swing and really a much larger supply of marijuana than they had back home. It was then that they immediately realized the enormous profit potential in smuggling cannabis from California back to New England. And as luck would have it, Jung had a girlfriend who was a stewardess who routinely flew across country. So initially, Jung had his girlfriend transport drugs in her suitcases on flights. But the frequency and quantity was not near enough to meet the demand. So as profits increased, Jung looked for more and more supply. And while he found that California was good, 
the supply of wheat from Mexico was even better and it was cheaper. So in search of even greater profits, Jung expanded his operation to flying drugs in from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, using his own private pilots and airplanes that they rented and sometimes borrowed without permission. It was during this time that Jung actually taught himself how to fly by meticulously watching and learning from the professional pilots he hired to fly his dope. So after a while, he's flying his own planes and business was booming. By 1974, which was the height of the marijuana enterprise, Jung and his associates were reportedly making $250,000 a month. That is the equivalent of $1.7 million in today's dollars every single month. Needless to say, Boston George, as he was now being called, had become very popular in certain circles, including being a member of Hugh Hefner's Playboy Club in Chicago. Now, everybody has heard of Playboy magazine and about the Playboy mansion out in L.A., but back in the 60s and 70s, there were Playboy clubs, and the original Playboy club was in Chicago. They had the same basic format as today. The clubs were based in large mansion-sized homes, featuring rooms where members and their guests were served food and drink by Playboy bunnies. The clubs offered big-name entertainers, comedians, local musicians, and, of course, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And we actually learned a lot more about these clubs in a recent expose on A&E called The Secrets of Playboy, wherein several former bunnies talked about their time in these clubs. According to interviews, the girls took quaaludes, which they referred to as leg spreaders, Marijuana was, of course, everywhere, with Hef himself demanding rolled joints by his bed at all times. And really, you could get any other drug that a member wanted. And, as you might suspect, the Playboy Club was well known by the authorities as well. And in 1974, they started cracking down. First was Hef's right-hand woman, Barbie Arnstein, who was arrested outside of the Chicago Playboy Mansion, her purse was seized, and cocaine was discovered. She was charged in federal court with conspiracy to distribute cocaine. Her boyfriend would be arrested next, and then it was Jung's turn. Boston George, who had actually been staying at the Playboy Club there in Chicago, he was sitting in his vehicle waiting to meet his marijuana distributor in Chicago when the feds rolled up and arrested him. He was sitting on 660 pounds of marijuana at the time. Busted. Now, unbeknownst to Jung, the man he was scheduled to meet had been arrested for distributing heroin and was angling for a reduced sentence as he cooperated with authorities to set George up. So from there, Jung was indicted, found guilty of trafficking marijuana, and sentenced in a famous courtroom sequence where Jung argued with the judge about the purpose of sending a man to prison for, quote, crossing an imaginary line with a bunch of plants, end quote. The judge was not impressed, and Jung was sent to the Federal Correctional Institution in Danbury, Connecticut. As he sat in FCI Danbury on what otherwise might have been one of the worst days of his life, Jung was introduced to his new celly, Carlos Letter, and little did either know their lives were about to change forever. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Jung's new cellmate, Carlos Letter, a.k.a. Crazy Charlie. He was born in Colombia, South America. His father was actually a German engineer who had immigrated to Colombia for work because he had a skill that almost no one else in Colombia had. He knew how to design and build buildings with this brand new thing called an elevator. So he was widely sought after in new multi-level building construction projects. While there, his father married a Colombian woman and they had four kids with Carlos being the third. Carlos grew up in Armenia, Colombia, in a city outside of Medellin. Now, Carlos never really was much for book learning. School did not really work out for him. So he began getting involved in the criminal element in Medellin. And those of you that know your history know that the criminal element in Medellin would soon be assembling 
under the direction of one Pablo Escobar, into one of the most powerful criminal enterprises to ever exist on planet Earth. But more on that a little later. So Carlos would live in Colombia until his parents divorced when he was 15, after which time he immigrated with his mother to New York in the United States. Now, while in New York, he continued in his criminal endeavors being involved in a small-time car theft ring wherein he would steal cars in the United States and drive them to Canada. Once in Canada, those cars would be shipped back down to Colombia to be sold. He continued this until he was busted for grand theft auto and smuggling stolen cars and was sentenced to federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut, where he would meet his new cellmate, George Jung. So it's 1975, and while these two are becoming acquainted, there are two very important things going on in the outside world. Number one, there is a group of guys in Medellin, Colombia, led by Pablo Escobar, that was gaining a stronghold over the world's cocaine supply. And number two, there was a huge demand growing in the U.S. for that white magic powder. And so you have two men sitting in a jail cell together, one from Medellin, where most of the world's coke was coming from, and the other a master smuggler from the United States. As Jung would later recount, the men spent countless hours learning from each other. Jung learning about the growing of the coca plant and the harvesting and production of cocaine. And Letter learning about the art of smuggling dope by aircraft into the United States. Specifically, Jung's experience flying marijuana into the United States from Mexico in small aircraft, staying below the radar level and landing on dry lake beds or abandoned runways. So before long, the two had hatched the obvious plan to smuggle Medellin cocaine into the United States by way of airplane. Then they turned their attention into the various ways they would launder money they earned in smuggling the cocaine, which was important because they were about to make a lot of money. So let's put this all into perspective on the supply side. They still say today over half of the world's cocaine comes from Colombia. And back in its heyday, 80% of the cocaine coming into the United States was controlled, at least in part, by the Medellin cartel. As for the United States, now cocaine was popular at the turn of the 20th century until about 1914 when it was criminalized due to its high potential for addiction and abuse. From there, cocaine was really dormant in the United States until the 60s when the hippies came along. Now, no, the hippies were not doing cocaine. They were more into marijuana and psychedelics. But what they did do was normalize drug experimentation and recreational drug use in the United States. So it was the next generation that adopted cocaine as its drug of choice, fueling the sex, drugs, and rock and roll mantra of the 70s and the 80s. So you had Pablo Escobar with a stranglehold on the cocaine supply and an entire generation of Americans wanting a piece of it. And that is the recipe for riches. So now let's discuss the economics of it. So cocaine values vary drastically around the globe. And of course, as with all products, they change with time. But fundamentally, the bottom line has remained the same. A kilo of powder cocaine goes for a few thousand dollars in Colombia. If you smuggle that same kilo of powdered cocaine to the United States, it's worth as much as five to ten times more. And if you're willing to bust it up and sell it by the gram on the street, you can make a lot more money. Let's say cocaine is selling on average for a hundred dollars a gram on the streets in the United States. So with a kilogram, that's a thousand grams of cocaine at a hundred dollars a gram, that's a hundred thousand dollars. So as a business model, if you can take something worth a few thousand dollars in place A, Colombia, and take it to place B, the United States, where it is worth more than 10 times its original value, you're going to do that. And you're going to do that as many times as you can. And like I said, if you bust it up, you can turn it into a hell of a lot more money. And that, my friends, is the recipe for the creation of billions. 
There is a lot of money at stake, which is why people are willing to kill and be killed over it. So beginning in 1975, Pablo Escobar had perfected his cocaine production and he was working on his distribution operation. He was mainly using drug couriers at the time who would carry drugs on their body or in their body in a process that was the brainchild really of Griselda Blanco. But the problem was the quantity was just too small. But help was on the way because soon George Jung and Carlos Letter would be released from prison. Time for a quick break. As most of you know, Lawyer Up has partnered with Webull, the online broker that allows you to buy and sell stocks or crypto or whatever you might be into. And you can do this directly from your computer or the mobile app on your phone. Webull is free to join, it's free to use. There's no cost to buy or sell, so it's commission-free trading. Better yet, when you sign up, link a bank account, and deposit as little as one cent, Webull will give you at least two free stocks worth at least $3 per share. So it's free money as well. So if you would like to join the over 2 million Webull traders, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below. Happy trading. So it's 1976, and both George Jung and Carlos Letter are released from prison, and it is go time. First, the two built up a small revenue stream through simple traditional drug smuggling. Specifically, they enlisted two young women who were U.S. citizens to take a vacation in Antigua, receive cocaine, and then carry it back with them into the United States in their suitcases. Repeating this process several times, Letter and Jung soon had enough money for an airplane. Next, the pair begins to fly cocaine into the United States and in the process, increasing their financial resources and building connections and trust with the Colombian suppliers as their unconventional method of drug smuggling then began to gain credibility. So Carlos Letter gets he and George Jung a meeting with Pablo Escobar, and they lay out the details of their plans to smuggle lots and lots of cocaine into the United States via airplane. Pablo liked the idea and basically turned the portion of his smuggling operation that moved cocaine into Florida over to Carlos Letter and some American they were referring to as El Americano, and it was from there that they would smuggle huge quantities of cocaine into the United States and make hundreds of millions of dollars. As they made more money, they bought more planes and bigger planes to smuggle in even more cocaine to make more money. But the problem was that the planes really couldn't make the entire trip from South America to Florida without stopping and refueling in the Bahamas and loaded down with cocaine that was risky. So in 1978, Carlos Letter just purchased his own damn island. Letter transformed Norman's K, an island in the Bahamas, about 200 miles southeast of Florida, into a transshipment point for Medellin cartel cocaine that was headed for Florida and the southeastern United States. Initially, Norman's K consisted of a marina, a yacht club, and approximately 100 private homes, as well as an airstrip. Carlos would quickly add a huge refrigerated warehouse to store cocaine. Letter also expanded the runway to 1,000 meters so that big planes loaded with tons of coke, could land on the island. Now, as I mentioned, there were other residents originally on the island, but over time, Letter either bought them out or bullied them out, and eventually he had sole control of the entire island. From there, he would protect the island with radar surveillance, bodyguards, and Doberman attack dogs. And Letter began to spread money around among the Bahamian government officials for political and judicial protection. So from 1978 to 1982, Norman's K was the Caribbean's main drug smuggling hub, and it was a tropical hideaway and playground for Letter and his associates. He had the local officials bought off with bribes and really had no worries as he threw massive cocaine-fueled parties on the island and moved hundreds of tons of cocaine with George Jung. So how specifically was Jung able to smuggle these drugs into the United States? Well, mostly by air, but also by land and sea. In the beginning, 
he would just fly in smaller planes loaded down with cocaine from the Bahamas to Miami. They flew mostly at night. The more success they had, the larger the planes became. And once the runway on Norman's K was expanded, they could fly cocaine in from Columbia in much larger aircraft, able to land fully loaded on the expanded airstrip. So the routine was that on Friday night, an airplane from Norman's K would fly to Escobar's ranch in Columbia. They would load it with cocaine, and on Saturday, it would fly back to Norman's K. From there, it was reloaded onto various smaller aircraft that could be flown under the air traffic radar. So on Sunday afternoon, the planes would exit the Bahamas in the sea of other plane traffic headed to the United States from the Caribbean. And then as they approached the coast, they would slip under the radar and go to their intended target. At the height of the operation, hundreds of kilograms of cocaine would arrive on the island daily and the wealth mounted. Now, once the U.S. authorities started catching on to these landing areas, whether they were dry lake beds or flat areas or abandoned runways, they became hot spots. So Jung and Letter started doing airdrops into the ocean and doing boat-to-boat -boat transfers way out at sea to bring the cocaine in by water. They also used commercial fishing operations where it would be normal to leave every day, go way out to sea, and then come back. So they used these operations as well to smuggle cocaine in by water. They also started doing some land drops. If an airport is hot, you can just drop the crate of cocaine in a deserted area where it can be picked up by associates on this side of the border. Then the plane lands, and if the authorities search it, it's clean. And they made hundreds of millions of dollars. And at one point, George Jung himself would have $100 million in a Panamanian bank account. Now, it would all later be seized by the government, but at one point, he was a very, very rich man. It was also during this time, 1977, that George Jung got married to Mirtha a woman of Cuban descent. And on August 1st of 1978, Christina Sunshine Jung was born. And life was good. Until it was. The first glitch in the Matrix came in 1980 on Jung's 38th birthday. Mirtha threw him a great big birthday party inviting members of the Medellin cartel, which, not surprisingly, got out of hand and resulted in a bunch of them getting busted. Mirtha included. She would be jailed and ultimately released in 1981 and reportedly to never use drugs again. Now, Jung and Mirtha would be divorced in 1984 and his relationship with his daughter became estranged then as well. And it wasn't like he was much of a family man anyway. Jung's parents were never thrilled with his choice of career and were constantly harassed by the DEA and the FBI. During his first incarceration, Jung would make audio tapes and send them home in an attempt to explain his behavior and make amends, to no avail. At one point, his parents actually forbid him from coming home. Now, his mom would later relent after his father's death. Now, in addition to family problems, somewhere during this time, the Letter-Jung partnership began to sour as well. Due to a combination of Letter's megalomania and his obsession to transform his Bahamian island into an all-purpose headquarters for operations. Letter's operation had grown to the point that he no longer really needed El Americano to help him smuggle cocaine into the U.S., Boston George was making about $15 million per run, so cutting him out of the equation made perfect sense to Carlos. So that is what he did. As Norman's K became his own lawless private fiefdom, he forced Jung out of the operation, worked directly with Richard Barley, who was Jung's stateside distributor, and joined forces with international criminal financier Robert Vesco to expand his empire even more. Now, once they split up, Jung was still able to use his prior connections to make a more modest living at smuggling Colombian cocaine and basically stayed out of Letter's way because in Jung's own words, he was acting crazy. Hence the name Crazy Charlie. And it's also important to remember what was going on in Mexico between 1978 and 1982. After Pedro Aviles Perez, Don Pedro, who is considered the father of Mexican drug trafficking, was killed. And that's another great story that you can check out on this channel. 
Felix Gallardo, Don Neto, and Rafael Caro Quintero Rafa would get together to form the core of what became known as the Guadalajara Cartel. And they took sling and dope to the next level. They started producing high-quality seedless marijuana, sensamia, in mass quantities in large multi-acre fields. They also started working with Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel in assisting with trafficking even more cocaine across the United States border. They worked mostly in the western United States. This relationship was facilitated primarily through Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros, with future legendary traffickers like El Chapo and El Mayo moving up in the organization. It was also during this time period that another drug cartel was rising to prominence in Chihuahua, right across the border from El Paso, Texas. The Juarez cartel had grown into a big boy in the narco world, and it had a major advantage because it was right on the U.S. border, the perfect staging area to bounce cocaine into the U.S. And it would take a decade, but it is from here that Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the Lord of the Skies, would yet again revolutionize drug smuggling by airplane, by not flying small planes under the radar, but by flying huge passenger jets loaded with cocaine over the radars. And you can check out that full story also on this channel. So even though they had split up, there was lots of work to be had for both George Jung and Carlos Letter, but it wouldn't last. Letter's downfall was caused by the attention his activities on Norman's K was attracting. A September of 1983 news report from NBC made public his blatant bribing of some Bahamian officials and the drug activities, and the government down there was really forced to act. So it froze all of his bank accounts, took over his property and possessions, and issued a warrant for his arrest. So Letter went back to Colombia, but after a couple of basically terroristic acts, the Colombian government was hunting him as well. So on the run, in the jungle, Escobar sends a helicopter for Letter and brought him back to Medellin. Now, essentially penniless and broke, Letter wanted to immediately go about rebuilding his fortune. But he was acting unpredictably. And although considered a founding member of the cartel, it is widely accepted that fellow leaders of the Medellin cartel wanted him out of the picture due to his radical behavior, which they believed would jeopardize their cocaine empire. Aside from just his party boy antics, Carlos was influenced by his father's ties to Nazi Germany, had gotten involved in politics, and had joined the MAS paramilitary group that was fighting the M19 guerrillas in the area. And I'm talking about vigilante groups. We're not talking about monkeys, right? And it all got to be a little much for the cartel brass to stomach. So after Letter killed one of Escobar's men at a party over a prostitute, enough was enough. He was sent to a farmhouse to hide out, after which someone informed the police of his location and he was arrested. And it is widely rumored that it was Escobar himself who provided Letter's whereabouts to the police, leading to his capture. From there, it took a while, but in 1987, a letter was extradited to the United States. And this was a big, big deal in the U.S. Because remember that in 1985, the Guadalajara cartel and others had kidnapped and murdered U.S. DEA agent Kiki Camarena in Mexico. So the battle between the DEA and the narcos of the world had become personal. This is another great story that plays out on this channel as well as the Netflix series Narcos and Narcos Mexico. So having captured one of the Medellin cartel's most powerful members, the U.S. government then used him as a source of information regarding details of Pablo's secret empire, which later proved useful in assisting the Colombian government and others to dismantle the cartel. And it took forever for Letter's case to make it through the U.S. court systems. But just before his trial, George Jung gets arrested with almost a ton of cocaine. Literally, it was 1,754 pounds of the stuff. And the U.S. government immediately requested his assistance in prosecuting his former partner, Carlos Letter. Well, even though Jung wasn't too fond of Letter, he initially declined to cooperate, fearing retribution from Escobar. 
But remember, Escobar didn't like Letter either because he had ratted him out. So Pablo ultimately would give Jung his blessings to testify. Ultimately, Jung would plead guilty to three counts of conspiracy and receive a 70-year prison sentence. But his sentence was reduced to only 20 years after he testified against ex-partner Carlos Letter. From there, Jung would serve his time and was released on June 2nd of 2014 after nearly 20 years in the Bureau of Prisons. He would stay out until 2016 when he was re-jailed for a federal supervision violation. He would stay in there only a short stint to be released from a halfway house back out into the community in 2017. Jung would remarry a Rhonda K. Spinello, and although absent from most of her life, George Jung would patch things up with his daughter, Christina, and they even launched a business together in 2016 called BG Apparel and Merchandise, BG standing for Boston George. The business is still in existence today with the slogan, I can't sell dope anymore, so now I sell dope clothing. The business is located in Santa Rosa, California. Christina would also write her own book entitled Recovery from Blow. The movie Blow would wind up making an $83 million at the box office, played by big-name actors including Johnny Depp, Penelope Cruz, and Ray Liotta. In fact, one of my favorite interviews of Boston George was him retelling the story of the movie producer telling him that Johnny Depp would be playing him in his biopic. Here, have a look for yourself. It is a classic interview. For this A actor, we've got, uh, we're talking with Val Kilmer. And I liked that. And then it was uh, Sean Penn. And I, I was totally against that. And then it was uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, and when they told me Tom Cruise, I said, Tom Cruise has never even smoked a joint for Christ's sake. I said, he's, you know, let's forget about that. Several months went by, and then I got a message from the council to, the, to call Ted. He said, guess who I've got to play you? And I said, uh, who? And he said, Johnny Depp. And I said, uh, who the hell is that? And he, <laughs> I mean, I was serious. I, didn't, I had no idea who Johnny Depp was. And he said, how about, you never saw 21 Jump Street? Well, how about Edward Scissorhands? Did you ever see that? Okay, it's about this effeminate guy who cut women's hair and he had electric hands for scissors. He said, where the hell have you been all your life? And I said, I've been smuggling dope in airplanes. That's where I've been making love to women. And he said, just meet this guy. You gotta love that. Where have I been? I've been smuggling cocaine and making love to women. What a classic line. After his release from prison in 2017, Jung would live four more years. Having been suffering from liver and kidney failure, he would ultimately die on May 5th of 2021 in his home in Weymouth, Massachusetts. As for Carlos Letter, he was tried and sentenced to life without parole plus an additional 135 years. But in similar fashion, in 1992, in exchange for Letter's agreement to testify against Manuel Noriega, his sentence was reduced to a total of 55 years, and although suffering from cancer, he is actually out of prison and a free man today. And according to his lawyer, he presently lives in Germany. So that is the episode on El Americano, Boston, George Jung. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you have not subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscriber button for me now. If you got something to say, if you got a question, put it in the comment sections below. And if you're interested in learning more about just about everybody I mentioned in today's video, including Carlos Letter, We've got a video dedicated to them on this channel, so check it out. That's all for today. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up.